Hi, everyone. We're Christine and Colin Fold. And in this session, we're going to be giving a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what actually happens in art contests for publications and shows. We'll talk more about that in a second, but we are both sculptors. We have juried a whole lot of shows, some international ones and regional ones. And usually when we judge contests, we judge together because we have a very similar aesthetic sense and we don't want to artificially skew the results. So we have judged Spectrum, the best in contemporary fantastic art, infected by art, the beautiful Bizarre Art Prize, the Walter S. Baird Prize for Literature and Art, many, many regional and local, hi to everyone who's signing in on the chat, uh, local and regional competitions and shows. Both in sculpture shows, sculpture and painting shows, and just painting shows. So we, we've sort of run the gamut. And we also, of course, enter shows. So we no. know personally the sting of rejection and that feeling of why do they hate my work why do they hate me i suck i should just quit all that feeling and we also know the feeling of winning something and feeling really elated and like wow my work really does matter and i am really good so we know both sides of it and we're going to talk about ways you can present yourself and your work to hopefully get you have more success in getting into shows we're going to talk about what really happens behind the scenes with juries we're going to pretend like we're not reading notes but we actually took some notes because we had a whole bunch of stuff we wanted to share with you guys so we're going to just we're going to dive in and it might be a little bit scattered and we'll try and field any questions you have and give you an insight to how the process works and we'll probably start there every contest that you enter whether it's for a publication or a show or even like applying uh, to be represented by a gallery there's a different process for during work everyone we've done has something different and yes. so each time we're kind of like oh okay this is an interesting way and it's really fascinating to actually get to see how they work it's oftentimes um, you have a jury but sometimes you just have an individual so you're talking about one person's taste and sometimes the jury changes throughout Every time that usually every year, the jury is different. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's pre-selected and it's pre-selected by the same people. So you have the same voices coming up again and again. With the jury panel, it's a combination of aesthetic tastes. And we have frequently been on jury panels where some of our favorites actually didn't even get in. Yeah. Not only didn't win awards, but didn't get in. So it's a combination of everybody's preferences. And we kind of look at it like ice cream because we like ice cream. <laughs> it's like chocolate and vanilla. Some people like chocolate and some people like vanilla. And it doesn't mean that chocolate is good and vanilla is bad. It's just different. So when you enter a contest, you have to have that in your mind that whoever is on the jury, mm, ice cream. Yes. <laughs> I think we're done. I know, we're we're hungry. Let's all go out for some ice cream. I feel like a strawberry malt myself. And if you just keep that in mind, if your work doesn't get into something, it's not that your work is bad. It's just that that particular jury might have preferred chocolate ice cream or strawberry. And it's also, it's a balancing act. So if you have five people on the jury, you might have gotten thumbs up from two or three of them. Mm -hmm. But if what it takes to be in the book or the publication or the gallery is four of them and you didn't quite make it, then you never actually know that. So the, the assumption is, well, I got the rejection letter. I suck. Let me just go become a dentist. Um, yeah. But that's not exactly how it is. And you can often have really strong fans who love what you do, but you didn't get in and you just actually become on the radar of the people who are your fans. Yeah, and we have frequently actually considered tracking people down who we just adored their work. Yes, that was and they awesome. didn't get in. They didn't get in, and we just want to contact them and say, hey, you're just awesome. wanted to let you know that, you know, there were people on the jury panel that absolutely love what you're doing. Keep going, yeah. <laughs> okay, because yeah. you are going to get into this thing. When we're entering, we do sometimes factor in who the judges. So we'll do a little bit of research. We'll go online and check out who they are. And that's just it. It's just an element to it. If everything they do is cartoons and we're a high detail realism oil painter, I sort of think, okay, appear. that doesn't mean that they won't love what we do, but it just, it's part of it. If they're all doing, if all the judges are doing what non-representational and we're representational, yeah, probably we'll take a pass. And a word about having friends on the jury. We are yes. oftentimes jurying our friends' work and people think, oh, well, that sucks because, you know, you know you're going to get in. Not true. Nope. We know our friends' work and we know how good they are. So and we know the caliber of mm -hmm. what they do. And so if they're not bringing their A game to it, we know it. And that can factor in. Having your friends is great, but it doesn't mean it's a shoe in 
because if you throw your B team in and your friends know what your A game is, you're probably going to be not getting the thumbs up. So we've heard people say things like, well, you know, if they got in because they're all part of this group and yep. everybody knows everybody, it's not actually true. You know, if somebody's work is really well known in the field, yeah, it shows up and we see it and we think, oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, wow, they really did great on that. But it's not a shoe in the work has to be good. And if somebody has entered 10 great pieces, in effect, they're competing against themselves because not all 10 are going to get into a publication. And that's something to think about when you have, if you're putting in a number of great ones and there's a balance that you, that if you've got five jury panels or six people on the panel, whatever the number is, and they all have to pick their favorites, they might not pick their favorite. Their favorites might be different. But so, so you might got, have gotten thumbs up from all of them, but they're different ones. So bear that in mind. That doesn't mean don't go ahead and enter what you think is your best work, but it can split the jury on everybody thinking your work is great yeah. and yet you're not getting it. We did. We did actually have that happen in an event where the person that came in second actually had two pieces that were in consideration for the top prize and the jury split both the votes and we weren't talking to each other because it was done online. And so that person that came in second actually got votes from the whole jury, but the votes were split between their two really great pieces. Yeah. So somebody else won, which was kind of interesting. A little behind the scenes about some of the things we've juried, and we're not going to talk about specifically what they are. One that we juried has lots of entries, like 5,000 or more entries. Mm -hmm. You, as the jury panel, have to go through all of those entries the first round through in five hours. That means that you're getting maybe one to three seconds to look at your entry. And so you, it comes in a little thumbnail on the screen, and you can click on it to make it bigger. But you're going through those things pretty fast. And that means that if you spend three seconds on one person's work, you're spending less on somebody else's work. If you do the math on it, you think, well, you know, you actually have a little bit of time, but that's just like the first round and you still have the rest of the final judging to go through and everybody's got to do it. So you've got to go fairly quickly, which is really almost a tragedy because people pour themselves into their work. We pour ourselves into our work. You can spend weeks, months, years creating a piece that only gets to be seen for a flash. And so that's something to bear in mind. Well, we, of course, love to look at everyone's work. So yeah. you know, that was a little frustrating for us with the speed of that one. But what to take away from that is enter your best work, but do be aware that your work should be successful big, let's imagine a big painting that you're looking at from across the room and it should mm -hmm. be successful small. So when you get up close and you look at all the details, it draws the viewer in. I'm not saying create your work based on how you're going to enter different contests, but just be aware that it should actually read pretty well compositionally on a small scale. The things that are yeses and nos are I'm easy. easy. Yep. It's just like, yes, no. The things that you're like, Hmm. Maybes. Maybe. Maybes take all of your time. That takes all your time. And just to add to what Christine's saying about the how things visually read uh, small and large, that's something to consider as an artist if, you, if you're doing actual work versus uh, digital work or online work. You want it to pull somebody across the room to look at it closely. If what you rely on is the tiny minutia of detail, but compositionally it falls apart at a distance, is that something you want to factor into your creative process? Again, you don't want to make it for the judges, but for example, we're looking at a piece that over my shoulder here. I'm going to push you over that way. There are a couple of them there. And does that pull you in? Does that make you think, okay, yeah, I actually want to walk across the pieces itself is uh, six feet tall. Do I want to go see the details? If I'm not interested, hey, is it still a successful piece? It's a good question for an artist to think about. So one of the other ones was done entirely online, which we loved because yep. we just, be, in the before times, mm -hmm. we went to a local hotel lobby and we had a nice dinner and they we had, had a laptop connection. and we just went through and we, we had the best time looking at everybody's work. What was not nice about that one is the selection of the finalists was based on a, a numerical tallying system. So whoever ended up getting the most combination of votes from the judges ended up winning the top prizes. And we prefer things where the judging panel actually gets to converse with each other because a lot of times somebody is seeing something specifically in a piece that we might not have. So if it's like a concept art piece, we can have a conversation with the concept art judge. Yeah. Or if it's a sculpture piece, we can say, hey, but look at all of this that is going on here. And so there's kind of this educational back and forth that can happen. So that one that was all online where we didn't get to interact with anybody, I would say that that was the downside. But there's pros and cons to it. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, an, absolutely. It's an interesting process. We've also judged things where we're an individual judge. 
And that's an interesting sort of pressure because there's nobody else behind you to say, okay, well, we all agree because it's just your opinion. And so yeah. you have to be open to work that is outside of what might be your own personal taste. And yeah. that's, a, that's something that I think most artists can bring to the table if they want. Yes, I have a style of work that I work in, but I'm also a fan of many other styles. And I think that may be the case with most people. So if you look at them, and that's where we, what, you know, I initially said, I do look at what the judges do, because if they're all cartoonists, however, they might also still like my work. In the same way, there's lots of cartoonists that I love, and I love their composition. I love how the, the energy and the work and whatever it is, the graphics behind it, and it has nothing to do with what I do, but I still have the ability to appreciate it deeply. And there honestly have been contests that I've judged where there are pieces that I would say, if we're being honest, are not to my aesthetic taste, mm -hmm. but they are so brilliantly done that they end up in the top of, of the judging anyway, yes. because I can look at it from what they are and the genre that they are and compare that with the other pieces and say, yeah, this one is technically, artistically, conceptually, mm -hmm you're brilliantly created and so it doesn't necessarily impact whether something gets in or not would we want to add it to our collection that's not really important no it's more does it hold its own is it a brilliant piece of work regardless of what it is and then we judged one where the organizers actually from thousands of entries pre-selected the finalists and our job as jurors were to just rank the finalists how we saw fit. And I totally understood that because it was important that the finalists represented the organizer's aesthetic. Yep. And so there were pieces that I knew had been entered that I thought were phenomenal that weren't in the finalists and there is nothing to do about that. And so you just embrace whatever system it is that the organizers of the mm -hmm. event have established. That's a little bit of the behind the scenes. We're gonna go over some basics about entering things. The first thing is to enter your work in appropriate contests. Last year, I did a really dumb thing and I had this tiger headed guy. The anatomy was, was well rendered and you know he was kind of buff. And I entered him in this contest and he didn't get in. And yep. um, I was looking yeah. at it. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah, wah. right and I was like that was dumb they're all like traditional figurative sculptors of course they're not going to let in a tiger headed guy <laughs> you know that was my bad that was nothing to do you know with the judging or whatever I just entered it in the wrong contest and I know actually what we're talking about here is contest but we've also we touched on it at the beginning we'll touch on it several times this also applies to other things so whether you're applying to a con whether you're looking at a gallery or something you've got to make sure you have the the right fit to start with mm -hmm. and I'm going to a couple different stories. One of them, we saw a piece that was in entered in an imaginative realism, and it was a pencil piece of the back of the mane of a horse. And it was so beautifully done, absolutely exquisite. I mean, you just wanted to go and give the artist a hug because, man, that is just astounding. And to this day, I remember it so vividly. Okay, it's not imaginative realism. It gets axed because it's in the wrong show. Put that in another show, it's going to win first prize. The same thing we, we saw, we've seen pieces where they're ballet dancers yeah, in, imagine, yeah. in imaginative realism. It's, it's heartbreaking because they're so well done and you really want to go, guys, that's brilliant. It's the wrong contest for it. Make sure it fits. The same thing with a gallery. If you're a pop artist and you take your work into a gallery that's traditional work and they reject you, you kind of, you showed up at the wrong place. So don't take it to heart that, man, my work sucks. Nobody likes my work. No, you just didn't pay attention to where you're delivering your work. Focus in on that. Make sure it's the right contest. Pay attention to the parameters they specify. So if oh, yeah. you're doing sculpture, we often, you know, you can't understand a sculpture unless you see multiple views. And yep. so we do composite images where you see the front and the back and the detail. And many competitions say no composite views. Yep. Pay attention. Don't enter that because they will eject it for whatever reason they don't want that if they want more information they're going to contact you and say please send me more images pay attention to what they're asking we're, we're going to actually touch on that several times because uh, it, follow the details follow the rules as artists we make up our own rules we do whatever we want but when it comes to something like this follow it if you're looking at a gallery and they say the submissions are on this date or we only solicit submissions 
don't show up at the gallery with a portfolio. Well, guess what? Don't show up with the gallery with a portfolio. It's not what you do. It's not, how, they make the rules. You got to follow with those rules that one time. Colin judged a contest once where the only specification he was given was that there could be no religious and this was imagery. A, this was a tough one because it was, it was small sculptures and there were a lot of good sculptures, but there was one brilliant sculpture that was absolutely astoundingly well done. And the title of the piece was Madonna and Child. And I looked at that and I just, you just go, oh man, that was the one parameter. If they call it mother and child, that's, that's the winner, absolutely. But by titling it the wrong thing, they were putting it in the judge's face, which was mine, that it was a religious piece and there was no religious piece. Yeah, inside. and as a, a juror, you do have to respect what the organizers of the event have asked of you. It's like, you can't just say, well, it's the best work, even if it is. You, you have to do what they've asked you to do because they give us parameters as well. And I think also just to touch on that, uh, this is a different one, but think about what you create and what is also out there. So if you do pictures of morning glories, and you know that lots of people do morning glories, whatever it is, you've got to think about, is your work going to be that outstanding that it can compete with all those other ones? And dragons. Yeah. And mermaids. Yeah. <laughs> and every, something new to the party. Every year, there's going to be a wealth of one thing. And that it, it's it's kind of something that the judges will talk about afterward, like, mm -hmm. oh my God, there were so many cephalopods. Mm -hmm. And you're just, just sort of up to your neck with cephalopods. And yes, if you do a great one, but if you do just a really good one and it's competing against 40 others, what is gonna make it outstanding? Yeah, and this isn't just us. We did a panel talk at an event after judging a, a contest with the other judges that were in that contest. Yeah. When I did the pre-panel talk meeting, <laughs> we walked up and one person said, what was with all the dragons? <laughs> <laughs> so we do notice and it's it's not you know if you do dragons great just think about how do you bring your own unique voice so if the parameter is they want work shot on a neutral background do a neutral background if their parameter is whatever 1200 pixels wide do 1200 pixels wide don't make it so you get rejected straight out now i'm going to talk a little bit about when you enter contests many of them invariably ask you to write a bio, an artist bio of a hundred words. <laughs> and we all have artist bios, but like they're all written in different amounts of words. So it's a good thing to be able to make longer bio and shorter bio. And then the and last keep them. Thing, yeah. I, I give them on the computer. It, it's a real drag. And you wonder whether, you know, does anybody read it? Christine will talk about that in a second, mm -hmm. but you can keep them and decide, okay, there's going to be one that's going to be 100 characters. There's going to be one that's going to be 100 words, whatever it is. Every time you come up with it, it's going to be 200. Sometimes like 100 characters is almost nothing. And you have mm -hmm. to smoosh everything down. You don't want to have something that's too big, throw it in that little box and have it crop it in half. That's and then you're like, the last thing I wow, touched. you've missed all the good stuff because I put it at the end. But you can reuse those. You can recycle those through, make sure they're updated, make sure, mm -hmm. sure they represent that what you are, what your art is, whatever it is, but it's a drag, but... I hate writing bios. Like, I hate it. Yep. Absolutely. I just like, ugh, the biggest eye roll you can imagine every time totally. I have to do it. But you have to update it because as you're in more shows or you judge things or whatever it happens to be, you have to keep it updated. And when it gets really short, you have to figure out what's the most important thing that I want somebody to know about me. And so you keep updating it. And then they'll ask you to write a statement about the piece. And my reaction is always, nobody reads this stuff. It's such a waste of my time. But a recent contest I judged, I read every single one. I read everybody's bio, the ones that got cut off in the middle. I'm like, what happened? I read every statement. I went to every person's website to check out their body of work. We're going to talk it, about that. I looked up their, their social media. And what they're posting, are they posting pictures of eggs and dogs or are they posting artwork? Because it was important to the organizer. Sometimes people do actually read that stuff and it did influence some of my choices. So it is important to actually take the time to do that. And on that note, 
don't start entering the contest 10 minutes before the entry window closes because you will be so stressed. At least start it a couple days before because invariably you've got your image and it's all good and you're putting your stuff in and you're like, oh crap, they want a bio and they want a statement about the work and oh And I've got 30 seconds darn. before I hit the enter yeah. button and it, it won't take it's it because yeah. on some contests, they post the people who are entering the contest online in advance. And so that is worth considering because that's free publicity. You're, it's out there. So if you get in right at that, right at the deadline when everybody else does, you're not going to get that perk. If you get in there several days before, it's going to likely go up. It's going to be out there. And the, not only the people who are the juries in the contest itself, but other people see it and other people respond to it. And it also gets, it gets in our little brains and we start thinking, whoa, that person is doing some brilliant work. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait to see it again. Or we hit their website and we have nothing to do with the contest, but it's out there. It's getting in the world. On this note, it's kind of outside of the contest, but it's kind of part of your presentation of yourself and your work. If you don't have a website, get one. Yes. I know that much of what's being done with sharing of art is actually currently on social media, but websites are still looked up and it's part of a professional pr presence. You don't, I strongly recommend, do not hire somebody to do it for you. Do don't, don't do that. Do it's your free. own, you know, get Squarespace or do Weebly. If you want a totally free site, you can do Weebly and they'll have their icon on the bottom and it's fine. It's drag and drop. It's super easy. You don't have to make it complicated. You can adapt it as you go on, but have a way for us to find you. Yes. Sometimes on Instagram, the actual usernames are so strange. We can't find you. We want to type your name into Google and have a bunch of stuff pop up and we go, okay, cool. We can find their work. And, and we've, that we've had people, we've had contests like that where it's important to the organizers that the person is an up and coming producing right. artist. Mm -hmm. And if you're invisible out there or you're on just one corner of the net, we can't find you. And that is terrible because you may be mm -hmm. doing brilliant work. If we can't find you, then you're out of the running. So be present. And it sounds awfully old school to think, oh, yep, you need a business card you need a website. They're easy things to do and have, but they're also still critical. So if you think that it's not important, I think you're, you're, you're going down the wrong road. And also with the websites, if you happen to be a newer artist and you don't have much work, just pick the best stuff. I'd rather go to your site and see five great pieces than see 20 where I'm like, wow, 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 wow. Oh, really just stick with your strongest work. And as you keep producing, you're going to produce stronger and stronger work and you're going to develop a fabulous body of work as you go on. I see a question here that says, how can you identify exploitive contests? If you can type in a little bit more information about exactly what you're asking on that, we'd love to respond to it. You may be talking about like vanity galleries where you have to pay a fee to have your work displayed. I would be careful about that. You can spend a a lot of yes. money and you don't know unless it's in your town whether they're even displaying your work or not there are a lot of people out there that unfortunately do prey on artists which is really dumb because <laughs> we're not the ones the millionaires out there but we're generally. desperate yeah and i would if you were going to work with a gallery or if it's a contest you're uncertain about i would do your due diligence and i would with a gallery i would contact other yep. artists that show there and just say you know off the record how are they to work with and that is something that's very important. I've actually had galleries where I thought they're wonderful. They contact me. I think they're great. And then I call some of the artists and I find out they don't pay promptly or there's issues or the gallery's about to close or something like that. And you go, <laughs> oh man, you just saved my bacon. You have to be very careful. And you also have to honor the sources that you get your information from. So if you're going to call somebody and say, this is totally off the record. I just want to know, is there anything I should know about this gallery? I'm considering entering my work in it yeah. and then honor that. So if they give you information off the record, yeah, That's we it. don't ever share that with anybody. And sometimes that can fly in our face too. So a side story, we had a good friend who's a brilliant painter yep. and he recommended us to this gallery that was having a show. We gave him like 20 pieces of work. The director came here and selected stuff. We hung the show and- it Looked great. Um, yeah, it looked really great. Yeah. And we went Prime down location. there to take pictures and the person at the desk said, you need to get your work out of here. The owner of the building is coming to close it on Monday and they're going to lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> and so we took it, we took all our stuff. We then contacted all the all other the artists. artists that we could and said, you got to grab your stuff and go. So shenanigans happen. Just be aware. If somebody is asking you to sign away the rights to your work, the copyright, Ever. don't. Ever. No, it is not worth it because they can 
turn it into merchandise and do whatever they want. The but sometimes they, they will ask you whether they have permission for, to mm -hmm. yeah. use it for promotion. That's yeah. terrific. That's totally Go fine. with yes. That way, if they're doing a poster, they're doing PR online, and they want yours to be the child, the child the, out there, the art and the image the, the, for it, go with it, because that's great. Yeah, but you're copy. never signing your own personal copyright away ever, 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 yeah. unless they're paying big bucks and they've done this as a commission. Right. And we're, we're talking about you personally entering shows. Yep. We're not talking about contractual agreements that you have with people that are commissioning you like studios and things like that, where you're actually being paid to make that work for the studio. Yep. That's different. That's a totally different yep. conversation. You work for Marvel. Yes. You're going to sign all of it away. Yep. That's, how, that's how it works. Yeah, it's a different conversation. In terms of contests where registration is free versus contests where registration is paid, a lot of times when you're applying for for like public art commissions, yep. there's no fee to apply. It's a very extensive. You're going to put a lot of time yeah, into of time. doing the application. Um, and I think that's fine. Grants, same thing. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes there's no fee. For contests, there usually is a fee yep. because if it's a show that's going into a gallery, there's a certain amount of overhead that they're trying to cover. They make the money on it. Yeah. But it's a business. We tend to enter things that are well-known. We're not doing a high risk thing or somebody's saying, oh, will you pay me a hundred bucks to enter into this contest? I'd be like, no, because entry fees are usually between 10 and $30. There is one contest that we enter where the entry fee is 80. I'm kind of like, maybe we'll do one entry. Yeah. yeah uh, maybe. Know. But, and also think about the reward behind it. If it's just an online presentation and there's, there's no publication, there's nothing lasting uh, outside of some, a website that you've never heard of. Factor that in. I see somebody saying, have you ever had, had somebody turn in somebody else's work as yes. their own? Yes, we have. Yeah, you think that's never going to happen? No, it does happen. We've also had ones where they turn in work that is somebody else's, but they have altered it slightly. Where they, uh, okay, I did the paint work on top of the sculpting yeah. and in, in a sculpting category. No, yeah, there was you're going to get busted. Yeah, there was one piece was nicely up on done. the screen. It was really nicely done and it was being considered for an award. And a guy that was just working walked by he wasn't part of the jury he walked by and he said oh that's a garage kit and we were like what Whoa. so the guy had bought a kit a resin kit and painted it really nicely but it wasn't his sculpture the organizer would have figured it out when he posted the finalist but none of us knew that because yeah. we didn't know that resin kit putting your best professional foot forward is important in all interactions this is going to expand beyond what we talk about just with contests and we're going to this is just about being professional and if you think this doesn't really matter with contests it does so uh, do you want to launch in to start with no, you a lot of this whether you wherever you go as an artist you are representing your work and consider that so how you dress that's part of your work. Artists, we can do whatever we want. We can look like we've dressed from the bottom of the hamper and we, we and you think, well, I'm an artist, that's expected, but people pay attention. If you go to a con, every time you're with people, you're, you're on, you've got to be aware of that. And sometimes you think, well, this is a time to let your hair down. Of course, if you had hair, but you know, late at night, you're, you're at the bar, you're having fun with your friends and you're, you're going a little haywire, but there are also art directors there and there are other artists and everybody's paying attention. So if you're dancing on the table with the, the, the lampshade on your head, I don't know that people do that anymore. I don't know that they ever did that, but that does play into it. And that can play into things where commissions in the future, where the one thing we remember about that person is, yeah, that was the guy that, really angry. that was the guy that was trying to pick a fight with everybody. He had drink, too much to drink and he's trying to, he's trying to get in a fight yeah. and we wouldn't hire him for anything we wouldn't recommend anybody hire him so what do we yeah, do with that? what we're saying is there's a lot to think about with branding that if your work is going to be priced higher you might present yourself more elegantly if you're kind of a funky graffiti artist you might have more of a grunge thing going on when you go to the events you know have fun but just be aware that you're always presenting yourself and your brand and you never actually know who mm -hmm. might be watching that is like, yeah, I think I might like to hire them in the future. And this is something that we run into where I'm thinking about a particular situation, a, a fellow we didn't know that well recommended us for a job that was very lucrative. We'd bumped into him a couple of times and he passed our name on to somebody who is looking for artists who do what we do. And wow, how incredible, but it was just somehow how we were presenting ourselves was enough to stick in his mind, which we were very grateful. When you're thinking about a work, a piece of work that you want to enter into a contest, 
make sure that it's your best work. Sorry about the dog whining back there. <laughs> Got a couple of hungry Dobermans. <laughs> I'll see if I could get her to stop in a second, but make sure it's, it's really finished and good edge to edge. And Colin's going to tell a story about that. I think there's a, something that you, if you, you, the piece has to be complete 100%. We were looking at a contest. And by the way, we love judging contests. We love being able to see everybody's work. It's something that is huge for us. We take it very seriously. And we, we, we know how much artists pour into their work because, of course, we're artists. And so we, we honor that. And it's a fascinating process. There was a piece that was just brilliant, 95%. But there was one foot in the foreground that was a train wreck. And other people saw it, too. So make sure everything's great. And so this took it from a A++ painting to a C because of that one little train wreck. Yeah, and so are, it can be a small thing. Yeah, there are a few people on the panel that really just couldn't get, get over the foot. It ended up being passed over for an award. In terms of what jurors get to look at with your work, we would love to be able to see the original piece because you can't really understand an artwork mm -hmm. unless you see the original. But what we have to deal with is the image. And so photography is really important. The really basic things are if you do 3D work and you're trying to create like in a cool environment, don't go to Hobby Lobby and buy the fake bronze and yep. stick the plastic plants in Looks there. Like, like just don't, don't do it. You can find a beautiful place outside if your sculpture is a, a fairy or an elf or something that enhances the work. Yep. Be aware if you stick your sculpture in something green, it's going to be reflecting green into the sculpture and it might impact how you imagine the piece is going to be seen we've seen all kinds of things we've seen people put their sculptures out on a deck and you see their decking and the <laughs> railing in the background and you think oh man that's a nice sculpture what the heck are they thinking also mm -hmm. something that we factor into if it's going to be a publication mm -hmm. it's going to be printed on a page and if most pages you turn to are terrific and then you have this thing where it's like oh my gosh, it's like sitting in somebody's kitchen. And you it's blurry and it's out of focus. And, and even if the work is great, you can't do that because it brings the whole publication down, even if the work is great. So how you present is really critical. One publisher that we work with told us, well, you know, I can contact the artist and ask for a better image, but if I don't get one, I've got to run the image I've got. And, and so that's hard. you can't make a choice to downgrade the overall quality of the entire publication because these images are not up to the same standards as the other images. And it's just part of taking yourself seriously, yep. taking your work seriously. Give people the best opportunity to see your work as accurately as you possibly can. And also you've got to think about, you've put immense amount of hours and energy and uh, creative spirit into creating your piece. Give it the justice it deserves and present it well. Don't fail on the race in the last 10 feet. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> cross Don't the stop, line. yeah, yeah. Don't raise your hands and go, I'm done. Yeah, get across the finish line. Yeah, and for the 3D people out there, I don't know where the wrinkled sheet thing came up. Oh, but don't. yeah, don't, don't do no. that. No, yeah, stop. Get a nice, you know, you can buy a paper backdrop for I think- Seamless. $40 yeah. or something. It's, you know. it's cheap, 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 and looks fabulous. Yeah, that, that stained, wrinkled sheet, we've seen the same thing, like when people get their, their children photographed at Sears. I don't think Sears exists anymore. Yeah. But, you know, you've seen that same dirty sheet, and you're like, oh, well, golly, don't do they it. they have the fold marks from the yes. sheet, and yeah. it's showing in the background. I, I just brought it out of my closet. This yeah. will look fine. Nobody it's, will notice. It's really distracting from looking at your yeah. work. And I'd like to say that it doesn't matter, but it really does. Yeah. You're going to try 2D or 3D not to have extraneous stuff. You know, so many of us are doing foot photography, you know, wherever, in our living room or in our studio. And if you've got the orange Home Depot bucket behind it, don't have it in the picture. You know, clean up the background a little bit. Yep. Sometimes with 2D work, people will like lay it flat to get rid of the glare and then they'll take it on an angle. And you can talk about that. Yeah, so you need to be straight on. And we'll go over all of this tomorrow, but just a little uh, teaser for it. It's got to be straight on. It's got to be in the middle of the photo, in the middle of the painting, straight on. You don't want it a little bit off to the side, a little bit low, a little bit high, because you get keystoning. And that's where something that's square starts doing this. And you see edges, things that are out of focus. It's all part of presenting. You don't want it to be skewed. We've seen great work that was laid out on a kitchen floor and photographed. And the work was so great, but you can see the tiles of the kitchen in the background. No, don't do that. 
an exception to that is if you're doing work. So a lot of people are doing paperwork where there are many layers mm -hmm. to it. And so we'll see the front view and then we'll see a side angle view if the organizers allow for multiple views so that we can actually see the depth of it. That's an exception. That's going to, you know, of course, be on an angle so that we can see the depth that's being created. Same thing. If the frame is part of it and you're submitting to a gallery, yes, you take a picture just of the art itself and then you take back off. We'll talk about that tomorrow a little bit too. And then you get the frame in it because that's part of it. Yes, that's different. Generally with 2D art and your picture, you're just going to actually have the art when you enter it in yep. the contest no frame. and no frame. However, a lot of people now are doing laser cut, beautiful frames that continue some of the design and composition mm -hmm. elements. And if the frame is actually part of what's being communicated in the piece, yeah, then stick it in there. If it's just a really great frame, probably just show the artwork is gonna be your best bet. We're kind of skipping out of order here, but since we're talking about all of this, if you don't have Lightroom or Photoshop, I would get it. Yes. It's, it's worth having just to make the adjustments on your images. They're both super useful programs. And when you're adjusting, try to make it look as accurate to the original as possible. We can go in and tweak things so it actually looks better. And that actually depends. If it's just an online thing, that's actually, you'd have to consider it could be part of the creative process, maybe. But there are shows, for example, I'm thinking of the, the BP portrait competition in London, where they pre-select everything and then you ship it to them and they select the original. So if you've gotten into pre-selection and then you FedEx your painting at great cost to them and they look at it and go, nope, doesn't look at all like that, you've wasted a yeah. lot of money and time. And a lot of show organizers will say in the fine print, if the piece shows up to the show and it's dramatically different than the image, the organizer has the right to reject it. Yep. And you have to pay the shipping for it to come back and Oops. you never got to have it in the show in the first place. Yep. A note about copying people, don't do it. Yeah, ever. Right. It's just, it's not worth it. Find your own voice. Most people that are in juries, most artists have an incredible visual memory. Mm -hmm. There was one piece I saw in a show that used a National Geographic reference. <laughs> so he was Worst big, ever. Yeah, of a cat. And I knew it because I had that cat image in my inspiration file and they hadn't changed it. They like literally took the Nat Geo picture and painted it and entered that. And that's, that's actually copyright infringement. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the, the show panel about finding your own voice and how, yeah. to, how mm -hmm. to use inspiration and not have it cripple your own voice. But think about that. It's not just that it's immoral, wrong, and illegal and all that, but it also squashes your own voice. And the reason you are an artist and bringing something to the world, it's your unique voice that is critical. There's nothing that Chris, Christine can bring to the world that anybody else could. And the same with myself and the same with you. So if you're gonna say, wow, I really love Frazetta, I'm gonna do a whole bunch of Frazetta Conans. Think it's twice already, into, it's, already out it's, there. Been, it's done already been done to death, if you will. But it also means that you're gonna be always a follower of somebody who is a master and you're never going to bring to the world what is really your own voice. Yeah, if you if you look in the museums, usually in the basement rooms, you'll see this collection of paintings and the tags will say imitator of, copyist of, student of. Yep. And so they, history doesn't you remember You will names. be forgotten. You can use something that you, you love as inspiration, but take it your own direction and yes. create your own thing. Have that the seed that feeds the tree that is your spirit. And it's really important because nobody will ever live life that will have your experiences and think the things you think and dream the things you dream and wanna say the things that you wanna say. The only way that you're really going to be able to get that stuff out, even though if you're like, I know I have something that I wanna say and I just don't know how to do it. What you have to do is to be courageous and start doing things. And mm -hmm. the more stuff that you do, the more that your voice is going to start coming out and ringing true. And we're going to see it. We're going to know. The you world know. will respond to your own distinct voice. Mm -hmm. They will not respond to being a copy of somebody else. Disadvantages of entering is that, you know, it's time and money that you could spend doing something else. A rejection hurts and it hurts all of us. Even if we seem like we're, we just kind of keep rolling. Yeah, it sucks. You just have to find a way to figure out who you're going to be in the face of yeah. failing. Whatever it takes for you to get yourself back up, dust yourself off, 
get back in the studio. The first major flop that I had, my mentor said, you know what? Get your butt back in the studio and make work that cannot be ignored. That's your job right now. Stop thinking about that. Make work that people are going to notice. And that was the best advice I could have gotten at that time. And something to think about from the perspective, I, I, I may well be older than most of you. I'm an old guy. The difference between where I am and where you are is that I have failed so many more times. I am so used to falling on my face. It's happened over and over and over. Your first failures are crippling. And then after a while, they're just annoying. Um, and then after a while, you're just like, man, I didn't even bruise on that one. You know, I used to like scrape my whole face off and now I'm like, well, whatever. Just because I just know how it feels. Wound. Yeah, it's going to heal, believe it or not. Yeah. And that's, that's very important to think about. And you have to, you have to know yourself. So we all have ways of dealing with things, but you have to know yourself. You have to know, am I reacting so strongly to this? Cause I'm exhausted. Do I need to get sleep? Do I need to eat something? Do, do. Go back I, to the ice cream. Yeah. For me, for me, a really good method is I have many irons and many fires and that can be exhausting. But if this one fizzles out, I can pour my attention and my love into these other things. And for me, that works. You have to figure out for yourself what you need so that when you get a rejection or a perceived failure or a piece doesn't go the way you want, you don't stop. That's the thing. You have to never quit, right? Yes. If you need to take a rest and go eat ice cream or walk with the dogs, that's fine. But it's important that you make the work that you're here to make. We should have titled this Art and Ice Cream. Um, uh, you know, it's also, it can expand beyond our, the subject that we're talking about now. As you put more irons in the fire, you stabilize your career. So when things fail, which they do, you've got the other things to support you. And this is something that if you're entering contests and contests are your thing, you enter a whole bunch of them. And then by the time one calls you and says, nope, you don't even, it doesn't phase you because you've got other ones. You, and you're like, well, this other one, that, maybe they'll be interested. So I'm really quick going to go over some advantages of entering things. Having a deadline is great because it can keep you producing stuff. Mm -hmm. Presenting your work to the world is kind of what we're about. That's the only way that people are ever going to get to know what, you, what mm -hmm. you're saying and what your story is. Putting your work in a contest puts it in front of jurors, whether you get in or not. So you don't know if three of those jurors, if one of them was art director and they're like, ah, I'm going to keep that person in yeah. mind. A uh, contest I judged, the organizer said, that they personally went through every one of the thousands of entries six times in the process of getting it ready for the jury. And she said that that's a large part of how she discovers new talent, that she's interested in checking out and potentially working with in the future. So you don't know what all the background stuff is that might be happening in putting your work out there in front of There people. may be many benefits that don't happen immediately. So whether or not you get into it, there may be things that are percolating in the background. People start following your work. They start following who you are. They start looking at your unique voice and they see applications and for we, it. we kind of are peeking around the internet yeah. saying, okay, so they're doing work and they're right on the cusp of something amazing and I want to be there when it happens. I, I want to front see seat. It. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And that's, that's really cool. And it, it can benefit you in many different ways. And if you didn't enter the contest, we didn't see the work, we didn't see it online, you're invisible to us. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just, it, we have no idea that you exist. So, There's a lot so of work exist. Out. Getting into a contest is really awesome. We all know that. Sometimes it comes with monetary rewards. Sometimes you get a job. It doesn't always go to the people that we know, the known names. So I don't know if you're paying attention to the beautiful Bizarre Art Prize where all of the winners were just being announced last week, but the person who won the sculpture category is a young artist. I know this because I was spying around on her Instagram. And she judged it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was one of the judges on the sculpture panel. And one of the things that she had said when she posted the news that she had actually won was that this was her last Hail Mary. Like she was, her family wants her to go get a responsible job. And she was like, okay, day before the contest, I'm going to enter this thing and, you know, just see and let it be a message. And for her getting to be a finalist was the message, but she actually ended up winning. And so you don't know. We all think, ah, oh, you know, all these really well-known artists are entering. There's no way. And uh, not necessarily the case. A couple of cheerleading things. If you're entering Spectrum in the unpublished category and you don't get in, <laughs> don't sweat it. That category has half of the entries. There's eight categories in Spectrum. 
half of them are in unpublished. And that's where all of the killer personal work is. And if you don't get in, just know that you kind of got your butt kicked by like amazing work. And it's a really high standard to get into that and just keep trying. Yep. Okay. It's not that your work sucks. It's just you went in the deep end with the big boys. Yes. <laughs> okay. And sometimes you end up on top, but other times there are other people that are up, up, up. Sometimes results are mystifying, even to us on the yes. jury. We're like, okay, I don't know how that happened, but you know, that's what it is. Uh, and we've seen that many times where with the pieces that we feel are very strong, aren't there in the final round. And that's, that's rough because you, you think there's no way that this wouldn't be there because it's, everybody would see that this is a brilliant piece. And then something else gets in and you go, huh, okay, how'd that happen? So the question is, my question is, when do you know your art is worth submitting because it is up to par? That is really kind of up to you. For myself, every time I do something, I'm hoping I'm going to do better. Hopefully my last piece of work was the best thing I've done so far. Do you wait until you're totally accomplished? Does that ever happen? I don't know. That's kind of up to you. But probably if you look at it and you think, I don't know. Is it really crud or not? I would, I would say that seeing a gap between where we are and where we want to be is really important. If I complete something, I'm like, yes, this is the best piece that's ever been created. I'm not going to get better. If I complete it and I think, well, you know, I can see these areas that I wish I'd done better on. The next piece, I'm going to do better in those areas. And I try to balance that. So it's very easy as an artist to just like beat the crap out of yourself all the time. Yeah, we and, do that. We're good at that. That's hard on your soul. So one of my rules is, yeah, you can say this is no good and that's not good and they should have done better there. But you have to find the coordinating number of things you did well. Mm -hmm. And maybe one of the things you did well is you actually finished the piece. So whatever it happens to be, I think it's important to see the gap in terms of whether it's up to par. I think a piece is successful when it accurately communicates what you're hoping to say. And sometimes that's really clear and sometimes it's not. But what I would say about entering is that the work you, you complete in six months is going to be better than what you did today. And in six years, it's going to be better than that. A little story, uh, when I worked for a glass blower, after I was done working for them, they'd let me play with the equipment. And one day I would, I was taking the pipe and I would start and dip it in the thing and then start it and then throw it in the bin and throw it in the bin. And one, after a few minutes, the guy was like, what is she doing? And he was talking to his wife, who also worked in the glass blowing studio. And she said, well, she's just starting over again because it's not perfect. And he told me, he said, well, you are never going to be able to finish a piece because you're going to get really good at the beginning and never actually see it through to the end. And I feel kind of like that with contests, that part of the muscle you need to develop is you need to develop your work. But entering a contest and doing the written part and the bio and the statements and figuring out everybody's different websites, that's another muscle. And so part of developing your whole set of muscles so that you're balanced as an artist is actually taking it through that process. Every time you do work, hopefully you're going to get better. You're going to push yourself. You're going to get closer to being able to express your true vision. And as you go along and you get better and better and better, which is where we all want to be, you're going to look back at some of the older work and go, it wasn't really up to par. And at that point, think about jettisoning it. So that can drag you down. And it sort of like, yes, we've all done stinky garbage work. It happens. But kind of like your kitchen stinky garbage you got to take it out and put it on the curb. You can't just go, oh, wow, it's festering garbage and that way I'm going to live with it forever. Or I need, I need 12 pieces of my portfolio and the last two of them are kind of the stinky garbage. Throw it out. Whether you physically throw it out, but don't necessarily keep it where people can find it on, for example, your website. And that has happened before where we're reviewing work and the body of work on the website. And we see six great pieces and four pieces that should have been jettisoned. So think about culling the stuff that is not up to your current standards. We're going to cover two more things. Insight for contests that accept artwork about anything but have different categories based on the media. I would say whatever your media is, do the thing that sings to you. Yes. Your best personal, this is who I am work in whatever media it is, whatever genre or subject matter that is. 
that's kind of one of the best contests because you can actually really do what it is that you are here to say. And do you recommend and know of any sites that host legit contests? If you're looking for publications in imaginative realism or concept art, Spectrum, the best in contemporary fantastic art, does have a concept art category. Infected by Art is another publication. The Beautiful Bizarre Art Prize, definitely legit. They're great people to work with. Mm -hmm. Call for Entry. I don't know what their website is, but probably if you type in call, call for entry, entry. Yeah. I have never had a bad experience with that. So I've done a lot of juried group shows through them and I've never had something where I had a bad experience with the gallery. So my sense is that they're pretty good. Art deadlines list. I haven't entered a lot of stuff with them, but they have a lot of crossover with call for entry. Entry thingy. <laughs> I don't understand them. Their, their entry thingy is confusing to me. I don't get it. I think I've entered one or two things with them. <laughs> I'm confused every time I go on their site. So if you can figure it out, rock on. Juried Art Services does a lot of like public call for art. I haven't had bad experiences with any of those online things. And that would probably be uh, Imagine FX. I have not entered things I've heard with those. them. Oh, yeah, Imagine that, FX is a totally a legit. Yeah. And if you get into that, you're good yeah. on you. So question, if it's not too late, do some of the art contests you judge have specific conditions that aren't shared with people entering, having visible social media accounts, et cetera? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, usually the specifications are about the actual images you send in. And the jury, sometimes we're being told it's really important to us that they're definitely presenting themselves as a professional artist. Yeah, producing work, or if you're something where it's an award for up and coming artists, uh, this is something that we've, we've done where we're, we're looking for people who are starting out and rocking it. We're going to be looking into the background, what they're presenting, how yeah. professional they are. Have they done one great piece or are they out there really working it? I mean, I hate to say this because it's a lot of work doing the website and keeping up with Instagram yeah. and Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and whatever else you're going to do. And don't think like, oh my God, I got to stay up all night and get all this done. No. It's going to be a cumulative thing over time and try to set aside a certain amount of time each day, each week, each month, where you can develop some part of your presentation. And over time, you're going to get it done. That's the only thing I can tell you. You have to stay focused on all of those things outside of doing your art. Unfortunately, we have to spend a lot of time on business. We'd like to spend all of our time just making stuff, but sometimes it seems like the majority of time is spent doing business stuff. Um, your professional presentation is part of that business. Okay, so even when people tell me stuff is good, it never seems to hold the candle to competition stuff. That's your opinion. But if you put it in front of some other people, there's going to be some people that agree with you and some people that say, no, actually, I think this is really great work. And the best thing I could say to that is that your voice is important. There's this huge creative stream that we all are riding down together. And wherever you jump on and jump off, the fact that you have a desire inside yourself to create something, to write, to sing, to write music, whatever it is, it's not a fluke. It's important. And one of the things that if I could go back and tell my younger self something, I would tell myself, I promise you, it's all going to work out. It's going to work out great. And don't quit. Don't step away from your creativity for 10 years or the rest of your life. We need whatever it is that you have out there that you're going to give to the world. Like the rest of us need it. And so it's a little bit selfish for us to say that, but it's true. You all have been terrific Thank hanging you. in there with us. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate it. Colin and Christine Poole, hugs from us from Santa Fe. Yep. Bye. Take care, guys.